OK. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, November's Kitchener-Waterloo Video Tech Meetup. Uh, my name is Chris Alikas. Uh, today, we have uh, Eli Mallon, Director of Engineering at LivePeer, who's going to introduce us to uh, LivePeer Catalyst, an open source self-hostable media server. So uh, sure, show. Go ahead, uh, Eli. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Christopher, for having me and, and, uh, and everybody for being interested. Let me just share the right window here. Cool. Yeah, so like I said, I'm my name is Eli Mallon. I am a director of engineering at LivePeer. Um, I've been at LivePeer since 2019, working on all sorts of different things. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about LivePeer Catalyst, which is our um, a sort of the brand new uh, release of the live peer technology in a in an easy to use um, uh, sort of uh, a format that anybody could run themselves and and start to to play with the full live peer stack. But um, I'm getting getting ahead of things a little bit here. Um, so <clears throat> sort of take um, I'll, I'll start off here by sort of going through the history of what live peer is. Um, I will then talk about LivePeer Studio, which is our uh, hosted um, service at LivePeer.studio that you can use to uh, do lots of interesting video things. And uh, I'll conclude by talking about LivePeer Catalyst and um, uh, some of our some of what we're excited about um, and uh, uh, why. Uh, why I'm uh, excited to be talking to y'all, um, and please do uh, spam questions in the in the chat. Um, I'm going to be uh, going over a lot of different um, a, a lot of different things kind of quickly, especially the the sort of history of the live peer network. I'm gonna um, I'm I'm not going to go super in depth on every little piece um, because I want to get to the the catalyst part that I'm excited to talk about. But um, if things aren't making sense or if people have additional questions about how some of this stuff works, um, I uh, yeah. So please uh, feel free to drop questions in the chat. So uh, yeah. So we'll start start by talking about. Uh, LivePeer itself, LivePeer has been around since 2017. It comes out of the, the crypto universe um, and was uh, uh, the founders of LivePeer were very tied into the, uh, uh, the rise of Ethereum and, and uh, some of that sort of technology and that, si that side of things um, is probably um, an audience like this. There's probably people that are uh, hyper familiar with every piece of this technology and people that uh, know nothing about it and people that are pretty proactively skeptical. So uh, I will uh, try and cover all of those things and and uh, and what we are using LivePeer for. Um, but first, I want to talk about what excites me about working here and and uh, and and why I think this technology and this is. Um, uh, and and the the live peer sort of way of solving problems is interesting. Um, that's because I'm interested in solving problems for everybody forever. This was sort of the the slogan that we came to on on talking about um, some of the the fundamental technology here. Um, what does that mean? Um, it means so I've got a um, a background in video, as do many people here. Um, and in the video industry, I find uh, at least prior to to working here, I found that things tended to get very siloed. Very, um, uh, I, you know, you'd work for some video service, and because video is so challenging to get right and takes so much engineering time, so much testing, so much pain and sweat, uh, that as soon as your company got to the point where it was some sort of video, something was working pretty well, uh, you were sort of incentivized not to share it, right? You wanted to keep that to yourself and play it close to the chest. And um, I uh, certainly, you wouldn't want to give it away to the entire world for free. Um, and uh, I had been frustrated by working at some companies that had sort of embraced this mentality and, and, and sort of didn't want to share some of the interesting video tech they had made. So uh, LivePeer takes a completely different approach. So um, the fundamental uh, core 
of Live Peer is the Live Peer Network. Um, the Live Peer Network is a decentralized group of people running servers all over the world, some of which are in traditional data centers, some of which are in people's houses in completely unconventional locations. Uh, but they're all doing one thing right now, and that is video transcoding. So that's a term that this audience is probably somewhat familiar with, but very briefly, um, if you're going to make a video service on the internet and serve it well to lots and lots of different audiences, you know, as a content creator, I might want to update, I might want to upload my video at 4K resolution, super high bit rate, so it looks really good, but that video isn't going to play back well on a crappy cell connection way out in the middle of nowhere. So this sort of fundamental, this, this, this transcoding piece is um, a, a fundamental part of uh, building a big scaled video service on the internet, right? Um, it's one that's often neglected, and it's often the um, the uh, the barrier to entry for a lot of especially sort of independent um, developers or people that wanted to you know sort of build their own alternatives to YouTube and Twitch. You can get started right away, and you can put a video file on the internet. You can play it back. You can say, "Oh wow, this is this is really working." But then when you start to scale and you get into this transcoding requirement. Uh, that's where things start to get really expensive. Um, really, sort of cost. Uh, it costs a lot to do this kind of processing. Google and Amazon will often charge in the ballpark of like a dollar per hour of video. So you can imagine, especially with a scaled live streaming service, you would start to run into um, some real bottlenecks there. So LivePeer takes this on very directly. Um, we utilize this. Uh, something called the Live Peer Protocol that is built on top of the Ethereum blockchain. Um, basically, there is, uh, as I mentioned, a big group of orchestrators all over the world. If you want to dig into this part of it anymore, you can go to explorer.livepeer.org. That gets into all of these different, um, gets into uh, all the details of the protocol um, and all the participants in it. This is just a screenshot from the performance leaderboard showing the, the people that do are presently doing the best job of doing this video transcoding. So um, basically how it works is I, as a, as a video broadcaster, can um, send in segments of video, usually one second or two second segments of video um, to get transcoded. It goes out to somewhere in the world. I'm not really sure where or who is is processing that video other than it's one of these people associated with a with a blockchain with a with a crypto address right um, and the video comes back to me I, you know I send out my 4k video get back 1080p 720p 360p video that sort of thing um, we do some verification to make sure that you know take a glance at the input and the output say okay yes that seems to be mostly correct good job um, and then the orchestrators get paid through the protocol for doing this sort of work. And this is sort of the, uh, I'm about to talk about lots and lots of other things we built on top, but this is sort of the core superpower that we see in the live peer network, right? That this, um, by utilizing um, a lot of non-traditional hardware, we can get this sort of radical 10x cost reduction in this crucial transcoding step of building video infrastructure, right? Um, a lot of this comes from um, those sort of the most popular hardware among our orchestrators is NVIDIA gaming video cards. Uh, a, a really mid-range video card, like a one that cost a couple hundred bucks, like a, um, my favorite is the NVIDIA 1660. Um, can probably process about 12 live streams in real time. Um, and keep in mind, I said earlier that, you know, ballpark numbers off the top of my head, but if Google and Amazon charge a dollar an hour for this sort of transcoding and with a single $200 video card, you can process 12 of them. Um, the, the economics start to work out really well there. So that's the live peer network. I'm gonna pause slightly if people have questions, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, is there 
any sort of protection with the respect to the the video that's going out to the network and like or or is this meant that you know i have whatever a 30 minute live stream of a an event that i don't like that i don't care about privacy or necessarily monetizing it and that's the type of video that would go out and not like you know the next movie that's going into theaters type of thing that or yeah yeah so i i would say it's very much um yeah it's it's, it's a great question it's one we get a lot um sort of two answers i would give there um one is that yeah it, if you are um you've got you know the avengers 3 uh, and you're about to to master it to send to movie theaters all over the world. I probably wouldn't recommend using a decentralized transcoding network and sending video out to that. Uh, that, uh, uh, but that's probably that, that's sort of not the not the sweet spot, right? Disney can afford uh, some some pretty powerful servers of their own to do this sort of processing, right? This sort of cause, you know, 10, 10x reduction in the cost of mastering a film is not a huge deal to them. Um, really, the, the economic sweet spot for live peer is in these big um, sort of Twitch style live streaming platforms where um, you've got lots and lots of streams, um, but they all have maybe tens to low hundreds of viewers. So uh, from a cost perspective, distribution is not the biggest pain point there. Um, uh, but this transcoding cost when you have hundreds and hundreds of streams starts to really add up. Um, so that's one answer is that's sort of a really sort of optimized around that use case. Um, the other answer I'll give is um, that would be really bad behavior by an orchestrator. Um, and the orchestrators uh, digitally sign every segment that comes back. Um, and there are mechanisms baked into the protocol that um, orchestrators can get punished, right? Basically, they have to put up um, LPT, they have to put up token, put up cash, um, in order to get selected for transcoding on the network. If orchestrators misbehave, do that sort of thing, um, they can get their LPT slashed, they can get money taken away from them um, based on like community proposals and that sort of thing. So there is some, there is some uh, incentive to that, but yeah. In general, I would say it's a network very well optimized for like a public broadcast where you wouldn't care that some untrusted orchestrator is, is touching the video. Great question. Cool, thank you. Cool. So this launched in 2017. Uh, I come into the picture a couple years later. I joined live here in 2019. And um, we, from there, um, while we had this sort of core, um, the network worked. You could send in video to get transcoded, get it back. People were enthusiastic about it. It was this sort of interesting novel technology. Uh, but, but there wasn't really enough to start a business on or, or really try and take this to a, to a wider audience, right? So, um, oh, this is, yes, situating live peer in for people that aren't super familiar with the crypto ecosystem or Web3. You've sort of got different companies and different organizations trying to work on different pieces of this. Don't need to memorize this slide, but um, this is one attempt of live peer to sort of situate itself in the, in the world here is... Um, uh, we're the sort of video processing layer in this this greater ecosystem, and we integrate with a lot of these other projects. Um, but yeah, back to what I was saying. So 2019, we get to Live Peer Studio. Um, so um, most video, uh, even pretty experienced video engineers that we worked with, weren't that excited about the idea of. Uh, you want to uh, to get started with this, you load up a wallet with some Ethereum and set up your broadcaster and all of this. They uh, A lot of people, the, the most common request we got basically was, this sounds cool, but can I just like sign up with an email and password, right? So this led to the Live Peer Studio hosted platform, right? This is the um, at livepeer.studio. You can uh, go, um, uh, uh, get started with doing lots and lots of interesting live streaming. You can upload VODs, uh, you know, upload video files to get them transcoded on the live peer network. Um, you can do things like multi-streaming where you stream into live peer and we'll push on your live stream to YouTube and Twitch and that sort of thing. Um, 
yeah, lots of re recording of live streams, clipping of those of those recordings, so that you can just take a clip and send it to somebody else. So around this sort of core superpower of the Live Peer Network, we built this full stack uh, uh, video platform. Um, yeah, just going over stuff like webhooks, so you can notify your own systems when users go live. Uh, uh, lots of different, lots of different video formats, just making people understand the value of transcoding here. Um, and this was pretty successful. We've got lots of uh, an increasing number of users building on the platform. Um, the other piece, of course, is that uh, running your own media servers is kind of a, a nightmare for a lot of people to, you know, serve video to thousands and thousands of people all over the world. Most people aren't very excited about taking on that problem themselves. Um, so uh, us taking care of all of that for you is, I think, a great way to get started. Um, yeah, I helped found, I helped get the Live Peer Studio project off the ground. I helped design a lot of the API and, and DevOps infrastructure that went into it. Um, we've got now full sort of developer-facing documentation for um, all the different pieces of everything you can do here that you can take a look at at docs.livepeer.org. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great platform for building lots and lots of different kinds of video applications. Um, on the other hand, I'm very, very proud of Livepeer Studio and it continues to be a very, very, um, very good product. And that one of the things I'm proud of, back to solving problems for everybody forever, is that Livepeer Studio is entirely open source. Um, you, every single component of it is MIT licensed or, <coughs> or even more permissively licensed in the case of Mist server that we built on top of. Um, and uh, theoretically, uh, you could boot up all of these things yourself and, and uh, sort of make them all work together and, and you know, run all this stuff on your laptop. Uh, in practice, even our own internal engineers had a hugely difficult time actually doing that when they were developing on the software itself, right? Uh, this is uh, our, our diagram of, so this is a, we, we had a lot of people coming, including myself, that had come from backgrounds in what we'd call SaaS companies, right? Uh, where they've got software and a software as a service and, um, you know, you sort of own the own the platform, own the infrastructure, and what do you do in that case? Well, you, you make a lot of microservices, right? This is how big companies operate, is they've got lots and lots of teams working on lots and lots of little microservices, um, and each team sort of works on that on their own, and uh, it's a good way to, when you're Amazon or Microsoft or Google, um, it's a good way to sort of operate humongous engineering teams at scale. Um, it was less of a good fit for us. Uh, it's sort of, so it's, it's sort of how we set things up because we had all had backgrounds in this and that's just kind of what you do. Uh, and then we got to the point where I, uh, I, I think it was a really big shame because we had all of this interesting technology it was all open source and permissively licensed. We had this community of hackers that was really interested in um, in using this and booting this up on their own computers and making changes to it and hacking on it and all this stuff. And it was just a huge pain to get all of this running in any kind of coherent way, right? So, so that's the limitation of, uh, while well, I'm incredibly proud of the software we made for Live Peer Studio, that was a huge limitation, and I see that that is really holding us back in a lot of ways. Um, so that takes us to Live Peer Catalyst, which is a term we had we had used before, um, but this has been my my sort of personal pet project for the last six months or so. Um, it was formerly called Live Peer in a Box, um, and what I was going for here is, can I take all of the pieces, all of these different services, everything that makes up the full, you know, full featured Live Peer Studio platform and put them all in a box? Can I, can I get them all working together in a way that it is easy for people to boot up? And we did. Um, excuse me. 
no, I just muted the wrong computer. There we go. Um, so I would now like to show off Life Your Catalyst a little bit. So this is uh, back to docs.livecare.org that I referenced earlier. We've got a, a brand new section over here called Catalyst. The icons aren't loading. That's interesting. There we are. Um, so this is, um, it's, it's still really early days for Catalyst. What I'm targeting right now um, and what was really needed by the studio team is the ability to boot all this stuff up on your laptop, right? Get get everything going here on one computer, and um, uh, so that's that's what we're targeting right now. Um, what we don't have yet, um, but is the next milestone, and what I'm working very hard on, is to get this to uh, deployable to a server, right? So somebody that really wanted to take all this and run their own personal platform with it, or do all sorts of other things, um, start to build some of these interesting decentralized media systems, um, uh, they could really uh, th th they could really do so. So that's that's our next milestone. But for now, what you can do is boot it up locally, um, get sort of a, a full copy of the Live Peer Studio stack for the most part um, running on on your computer that you can then um, play around with and 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 do anything you want with. So that's what I'm gonna show off here so uh everything right now is a docker image no idea if that is a term that this audience is familiar with or not docker is just a, a service that or a, a, yeah cool cool so that's a, a software that lets you um really easily run sort of more sophisticated pieces of software in a sort of isolated environment so i'm going to copy this command out of the docs here and run it locally um, we're working on a few things about the developer experience here. One of the limitations right now is uh, you have to sit through a, a bunch of spam and errors as a bunch of stuff boots up and crashes and boots up until all the sort of prerequisites are ready to go here. So looking to streamline that, but we'll just enjoy the uh, everything scrolling past do you, here. Do you, do you still need a wallet to run Catalyst? Good question. Um, the you would need a wallet if you wanted to use Catalyst to transcode on the Live Peer network. Right oh, okay. now, uh, so I'm running. This is a, a Linux VM on a Windows host, um, and ca the the Catalyst Docker image is configured to do local transcoding. So super not scalable. Um, you're not going to be able to do lots and lots of of live streaming on this. I've actually got it set to do a single low resolution transcode. Um, just to uh, really minimize the amount of resources. Remember, this was originally targeted at developers that were hacking on the platform. Um, so it wasn't so important that they had super high quality video. They just needed to make all the features work, right? Um, but that's something we want to add. That's that we do want to um, facilitate people. Um, you know, you can sort of add your wallet, fund it with Ethereum, and and uh, transcode on the Live Peer Network. So that's definitely on our roadmap as we move toward the self-hostable version. Um, cool. So following the documentation here, um, I can get at the dashboard at localhost eight 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 eight. Um, I need to do some rebranding. You see a lot of studio, you see the word studio appear a lot here that I need to uh, allow to customize into Catalyst. But like I said, still still early days. Um, so username of admin at example.com and a password of a live peer. And here we go. So this is the this is the full live peer studio platform. You get this with running this single command on your computer. Um, I'll show off a couple of the features that we have here. Uh, one is live streaming. So I go to this uh, uh, live stream that's got sort of hard coded all, all fours here. And I'm going to stream into it with FFmpeg. I discovered in the prep for this a bug in our WebRTC output, which is frustrating. Usually this would appear nearly instantly, uh, but now we have to wait for WebRTC to fail and it kick into a to an HLS fallback before it shows up. 
but this will um, very quickly here. There, there was a lot of uh, talks at DMUX about media over quick and, and doing that versus WebRTC. Not For sure. sure. We actually, yeah, we've experimented with both. We had a, a, a client, um, a studio client that was really interested in running um, uh, streaming over quick. Um, and we set that up and they've gotten some experience with it. Um, I've been very happy with uh, MISP server's uh, WebRTC output for the most part. Um, it, uh, uh, not in this, uh, setting obviously but um, in uh, in production when you're not running on a, on a local machine here we've been seeing really really good results with really really fast startup times actually show that off right um, let me find one of my commands to uh, send to yeah there's a production one don't 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 tell anybody it's my secret stream key it's the, it's the Bring down the world if we now i'll revoke it after this it's fine uh d1df uh so if i go to uh production live peer dot studio here um click into my click into my transcode we should see hmm well, I was waiting for something to go wrong, and that was probably going to be it. Ah, there we go. Yeah, so we get this uh, this popping up pretty quickly. Um, and we've been seeing actually really good. Um, WebRTC isn't usable absolutely everywhere, and we're still running with an HLS fallback in some cases. But um, we've been very frequently seeing like two to five second latency at scale with, with our WebRTC streaming, which I've been really happy with. Um, our local one just doesn't want to give up here. Never mind. Um, the other, uh, I'll let that spin a little bit longer. Actually, let's go over to Chrome here. Um, we also have assets. So this uh, this is a recording from earlier that I got up here. Um, can upload. I'll uh, just do a, a tiny MP4 file so it processes really quickly. Um, and you can see it it goes through here um so this is how you could if the live streaming is how to how to imitate twitch this is how to how to imitate youtube and and upload clips to get processed that sort of thing should be done in just a moment here yeah there we go chrome help me out um so this is our this is our currently running live stream that is going into our local catalyst instance and um, some other cool features, just as long as I'm here to show off. We've got these multi-stream, oh, that's a very funny bug. We've got these multi-stream targets. Uh, this is just because I'm zoomed in, right? Yeah, so multi-stream targets for, uh, like I said, you can put in a, a Twitch or YouTube stream key here and, and push straight through. Um, and uh, as soon as you go live locally here, so this is the kind of thing, as soon as it's possible to deploy Catalyst to your own server, that's the kind of thing as a, as a content creator, I might want to do that. Just, you know, none of the other features needed. I just want multi-streaming. And that's the kind of thing that, I, the kind of use case I want to enable with this sort of open source permissively licensed server with the with front end and, and everything like that. Um, we've got our asset uploaded here. This is just a little five second clip that I was showing off, but um, you can download an MP4 of that or or share it using the built-in live peer player. So uh, lots of lots of interesting features here. Um, webhooks, like I talked about before, this is for if you want to uh, notify some other piece of software when you go live or, or that sort of thing, we can send that off. Um, API keys for if you're going to integrate this with your own software, you can create those here. And, and uh, we've got this sort of full API documentation back on, on uh, docs.livepeer.org for all the different pieces you can do here. 
access control. So this is um, if you want to have a live stream, but you don't want anybody to be able to watch it. Um, this is how you can uh, uh, sign URLs and this sort of thing to, to only give certain people access. And uh, yeah, and the studio team, everybody at Live Peer, we're all working on lots of, we've got a, we've got a future backlog. Um, and uh, yeah, this is really exciting to me, having worked in video before, um, in terms of what you can get from a sort of batteries included, um, a dashboard bundled um, uh, piece of, uh, of technology here. Um, this is, I think, a, uh, I think a really, really appealing and, and sort of competitive offering here. Um, I also want to uh, shout out the Mist server team. So uh, Live Peer is uh, the Live Peer live streaming layer is built on top of Mist server, um, whose team we have um, we've worked closely with throughout the years. Um, in 2021, we actually acquired Mist server and open sourced their technology uh, so that we could get this sort of fully open source free software layer for um, uh, for live streaming. Um, and this is what I like about live peer. It's what I like about working in Web3, right? This is a bad business practice 99% of the time, right? You should not buy a company and open source their software. Why would you do that? That doesn't seem like a good business move at all. Um, but it was for us because we want to do everything we can to promote the use of live peer and promote the use of the live peer network. Um, that's the number one bottom line for, for everything that we're doing. Um, and so there was this great technology that worked really integrated really well with the live peer network. You could have transcode and live stream low latency. Um, but, uh, it didn't, um, it wasn't open source. So it made sense for us to do that. Cool. Um, yeah, Christopher. I, 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 another question with respect to how, how is, um, do you have similar kind of options in terms of like what encoders to use if you're using the Intel encoder or if you're using the NV Inc encoder or, and like, are all the knobs and, and whistles available through the platform or? A great question and no. Okay. <laughs> uh, there are some knobs and whistles. Um, so something that's very interesting about how we operate, uh, how the network operates is um, you are sending video out somewhere in the, in the ether to get transcoded and it comes back. Um, and so uh, we, you can certainly put parameters on that, right? You can say, I want the output video to have this width and this height and this frame rate and this bit rate. Um, you can even go as far as to say, we work mostly with H.264 video at the moment, though um, we're dipping our toes into AV1 and VP8 and that, VP9, that sort of thing. Um, so you can even go as far as saying, here's the H.264, you know, I want H.264 constrained high profile. Uh, this is uh, stuff like this. Um, and you can do all of this because all of those things are verifiable, right? You can get the video back and say, wait a minute, I asked for 720p video and you gave me 1080p video. Um, and you can actually then submit that as evident because you have this signed video segment you can submit this as evidence hey everybody this this orchestrator is is screwing up um, we should take their money away or not use them or something like that um, but when you get really down into you know ffmpeg kind of flags when you're really talking about specific encoders it's probably impossible to validate that this this uh, footage that came back went through an Intel quick sync encoder or went through an NV ink encoder. Um, you can't prove that. And so the live peer network can't really in, in um, other than through, you know, trust that people aren't going to lie and that sort of thing. We couldn't really offer that as a feature. Right. Um, yeah. Great question though. And um, yeah, another thing where it's, if you need absolute perfect control of every little piece of video that, that then, um, then maybe the live peer network isn't for you, but for especially for, for lots and lots of public broadcast use cases, you don't care about every little nuance of the video. You just want something that's affordable and 
and looks reasonably well, you know, looks reasonable and that sort of thing. And, um, and that's where it's a really good fit. I had a second question following up. Um, do, does live peer then act as the, the origin for the HLS hosting then? Or yeah, but, is it the individual, uh, what are the, the uh, transcoders or, or whatever they are? Great question. The, the answer is, uh, is not yet. So, so Live Peer Studio is our the hosted platform where Live Peer Incorporated operates a big network of servers. Um, and we would be the origin of the video there. Uh, the, the Live Peer network at the moment is very uh, like transactional, is the word that comes to mind. You send in a video, a two second video input segment and get a two second audio segment, which allows us to sidestep the issue of, um, you know, where we haven't yet taken on the problem of decentralized distribution, which is a lot stickier in a lot of ways. Decentralized distribution means you need to get into decentralized moderation and, and, um, and lots of different um, uh, components there. But my focus, and, and, and I will say that, um, and, and we're working toward that, right? The orchestrator, the live peer orchestrator community is very interested in expanding the capabilities of, they're going through all this work running lots of different transcode nodes. They would love to start hosting video. They would love to, um, they would, uh, we want to start developing protocols that allow you to broadcast video in a decentralized way so that as a live streamer, I could stream into server A and you play it back from server B and look at some digital signatures that confirm, oh yeah, I'm actually looking at Eli's live stream right now. This is correct and it hasn't been tampered with, that sort of thing. Um, so we're interested in all of that, but that um, right now it's it's sort of just the decentralized part is just the transcode layer. And then um, with Catalyst, we're hoping to you know, get get more people deploying this full server stack, increase the capabilities of orchestrators. We're starting to to work toward that decentralized distribution world. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So I just wanted to jump on a, a couple more things that I'm excited about on Catalyst here. Um, so reasons I'm excited, and I've alluded to a couple of these before. Um, but one is that um, the sort of com many of the the comparable video stacks that I've worked with um, have been like uh, you know arguably if you boot up something like Wow as a media server you get kind of something like what I just showed off in terms of a, a dashboard and and a sort of full featured suite. But um, it's all in Java, uh, and aside from the fact it's not free um it's it's all in a lot of media tech at the sort of enterprise level is in java which is uh the right choice for a lot of big companies and is very predictable in its usage but um uh, as soon as you start to move down uh closer to the metal and working with go and and uh the server c plus plus layer you really appreciate the seeing the seeing the frames that much faster and um, being that much more efficient in terms of resource usage on servers and and that sort of thing um so that's exciting um on our roadmap after uh, we get the self-hosting case working well we have a static linking so this is uh Instead of this this Docker image that I'm distributing right now is the quick and dirty way to get all of these different components together. Uh, the really, really beautiful thing would be to get a single statically linked cross-platform binary. So you can just run this single program called Live Peer Catalyst and you boot it up on your computer and it can be very easily distributed through um, stuff like uh, you know, like Debian repos and 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 homebrew on Macs and this sort of thing. So, um, a really um, much more appealing distribution channel over there. Um, I'm excited that it's actively supported. Live Beer Catalyst is not the only open source media server in the world, but a lot of the other ones are run by teams of volunteers and that sort of thing. But um, maybe they work on very specific use cases for clients and and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, LivePeer Catalyst is the core of the LivePeer Studio hosted platform. So everybody working on that is running Catalyst locally, building features against Catalyst. Um, so we are going to continue to see lots more um, 
both feature work and reliability work, stability work, that sort of thing. Um, and finally, the, we've got this mechanism for funding in the live peer protocol um, that I won't dive too deeply into right now, but something we did recently is called Live Peer Delta. And basically, it creates this treasury um, of public goods funding um, that can go into, is designed to be um, used to, to further, um, basically funds this grants pool that the participants on the network can vote on um, who should that money should be distributed to. And it's designed to um, reward and incentivize people for contributing to the software, building on the network, um, adding new capabilities, this sort of thing. Um, so one of the projects, for example, that we're working on right now would be to add not just transcoding, but also um, AI compute to the network, stuff like object detection and, and uh, scene analysis and this sort of thing, um, to add that as um, the sort of next sort of, in, in addition to just this transcoding video processing, this is the next sort of thing that you could do on the decentralized network. Um, and so we've got funding built into the protocol for doing that sort of thing. And I think it's going to lead to this really interesting sort of feedback loop where build more features, get more users, more people are interested, more people want to contribute, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I think I went over these already. Next milestone is self-hostable and then uh, lots and lots and lots of other things to take over the world. Um, if people are interested in this, especially at this stage, you know, um, when we're talking about laptop dev, is if anyone would be interested in contributing at all the live peer catalyst, we would love to have you. Um, and there's potentially funding in it in the future as part of this live peer delta mechanism. Not even in the future, just in the present, if people are writing proposals and that sort of thing. Um, so we have the catalyst hackers group. Um, I'll uh, link it in the chat here. Um, but uh, we meet every two weeks. Um, oops, uh, wrong window. Uh, and discuss where uh, where Catalyst is, what we want to meet next, um, and collaborate on the future of decentralized video. So that is, I'm running those meetings every every two weeks. Would uh, love if anybody's interested there. The other. Um, the other place uh, is to talk about this stuff is uh, here.org slash Discord. Uh, live here primarily uses Discord as our communications platform. There's a, a broadcasting channel on that Discord where um, I've been helping people set up Catalyst and play around with it, get started. Um, so if the, anything I've said is at all interesting, would love to uh, would love to see people there. And would love if people have any more questions. Thanks very much. Yeah, Grady. Uh, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, you're not muted, but I can't hear you. Might have to select mic and Google. Should we jump to Aaron while Grady figures it out? Yeah, Aaron, if you want to ask. So uh, Chris and I actually worked on a similar project to take one of our products and make it available as a Docker container. Um, and originally, we did exactly the same command line thing as you. But lately, we've been looking at using Docker Compose as a way of spinning things up without having to have such a complicated command line. Have you thought about using that? Yeah, yeah. I think we totally could for. Um... Uh, for the the local boot up use case, um, yeah, essentially porting a lot of that command line complexity to a Docker Compose file. Um, uh, totally could do that. I, I like I said, I, the the Docker image is a, a stopgap at the moment. Um, all of the technology we're working with in Go and C plus plus ought to be able to statically compile in a in a cross platform kind of way. Um, so I don't want to invest too much in the Docker tooling because what I really, really want is a single statically linked binary, right? I think that's been yep. a really successful model for uh, projects that um, get a lot of traction. So 
Um, uh, but yeah, no, a Docker Compose file might is is I think uh, harmless and and could help people get started there. Cool. Let's see if Grady, his mic works again. Or so Grady said. I talked to Eric Tang in two thousand. He said the secret sauce was that there were all these compute nodes kicking around. I'm assuming two thousand is a typo. That seems really, really early for. Uh, 2020. 2020. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Right. So that this was especially um, so uh, you know live here being born out of the crypto universe. There were a lot of people with these that had bought a bunch of GPUs to do crypto mining, uh, and then this, the, a combination of things happened. People made dedicated hardware for crypto mining that was more efficient than GPUs. And also crypto tanked. When I joined Live here in 2019, you know, crypto wasn't real anymore. We weren't ever going to be talking about it, right? Um, and so that was part of the, especially early on, that was part of our secret. To, the secret to our success was there were these data centers full of NVIDIA graphics cards that were great at doing this kind of video processing that were just sitting there idle. Um, and so that was uh, but, part, of the, part of the secret there. And the se second part I, is is that. Uh, I can, I'm guessing a lot of the GPUs are now focusing on AI. Does that change, I guess, the the overall outcome? Yeah, yeah. I can I can, I can only sort of speak speculatively. We're just sort of kicking off the process of the of the sort of AI video integration stuff. Um, but what I would say is. Um, for for live peer the for the live peer network, the does that change the mix of free video encoders? Um, I think uh, as the hardware marches on, I, I, I'm not so um, I'm not so worried about that. One of one of the nice things is uh, uh, so uh, on these so it's mostly Nvidia um, GPUs that we're talking about here, um, and they have actually dedicated chips they're called nv inc and nv deck that do some of the heaviest lifting in the video encoding that's not to say that it has zero percent load on the rest of it but um you can it's actually possible to max out the nv usually the nv deck chip the video decoder on the hardware um, and not use the the rest of the gpu especially when you're talking about a big um when you're talking about ai models you're talking about like GPUs with 48 gigabytes of, of video RAM or, or more. Um, and so it's actually likely that maxing out the video hardware on the chip would not use anywhere near the full capacity of a card like that. Um, so I don't see those two things as in conflict. <clears throat> the interesting thing about AI is uh, for the live peer network, the more deterministic it can be, the better. And there's a lot of non-determinism in these AI models a lot of the time. Um, there's also work to make them deterministic, so you can run the same model on two different pieces of hardware and get exactly the same result. Um, but that kind of determinism makes it really good for the network, right? Because then it means you can, if you think somebody's cheating or something like that, you can rerun their exact same work on different hardware and construct a proof that, no, they, they didn't actually uh, do a good job on this. Great question, something we're super excited about getting into, of course. So yeah, is anyone else with uh, a question? Uh, well, uh, Eli, I'd like to thank you and uh, thank everyone for, for coming out. Uh, this is super exciting. I'll uh, post the links. Um, in video dev and in uh, some of the other Slack I'm part of. And yeah, so uh, thank you, Eli. Thank you, everyone. And uh, cheers. Uh, right on. Have a good rest thank of your day. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah. Thanks, Eli. Take thank care. You. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you.